So with those odds in mind, let's go on the beat. Presented by ChevyDriveChicago.com with Mike Renner, NFL Draft Analyst for Pro Football Focus. Mike, you threw out those odds in your first mock draft. And not only have the Bears pulled the trigger on the first offensive lineman, but you took a lineman that most people weren't thinking would be there. Who's the lineman and why'd you make the choice? I went with Darnell Wright, the Tennessee offensive tackle for the Chicago Bears. I, I think it makes sense because the need obviously comes on the right side. And I don't want to be flipping a tackle if I don't have to, especially a lot of the guys in this class who are already kind of behind the eight ball developmentally. Darnell Wright's played a bunch of years. He's played four years in the SEC and three of those at right tackle. And he played this last year at a very high level, shut down Will Anderson, who's probably going to get drafted ahead of him in their matchup. And I just think the power he plays with pairs real well with Justin Fields in that you don't see a lot of true edge rushes. You see a lot of guys trying to collapse the pocket, bull rush, keep Justin Fields inside. Dar Darnell Wright holds up to the bull rush better than any other tackle in this draft class, so it just makes too much sense. What did Will Anderson say about him? <laughs> he said he didn't want to face him again. Uh, I mean, it was – I think – Will Anderson got him once, but Will Anderson only getting you once over the course of an entire game when that guy's going to be probably the number three overall pick at worst, a top five pick, um, that's pretty darn good. And so in this tackle class where you have a lot of guys with kind of similar skill sets and a similar range, I kind of see them as, whether it's him, whether it's Broderick Jones, whether Paris Johnson, I, I think I see them all as similar caliber tackles. Give me the guy that kind of fits what I want to do offensively. Uh, I'm not, I don't think it's a reach necessarily on my draft board. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about Adetamawa Adabare out of Northwestern. He has opened a lot of people's eyes, and you know Bears fans are dying to get a three technique, and they're thinking maybe if they don't go after Jalen Carter, Adabare might be there. What, what's going on with his draft stock since the, the, the season ended and the draft process has begun? Yeah, very intriguing, dude, because for exactly what you mentioned there, they he fits really well what the three technique position is, but didn't play it at Northwestern. He was an edge guy, only started kicking a little bit inside this past season, but then he goes to the senior bowl and has some reps in the one-on-ones as a pass rusher that really opened up my eyes, opened up a lot of people's eyes where it's like, oh, this guy could be something real on the inside. And then he goes to the combine. And what he did there was one of the single best performances we've ever seen from a defensive lineman at in Indianapolis. So, when you have a first round pick and you really want to swing for the fences, he would be a swing for the fences because I think his utilization at Northwestern and basically where he played is not going to be optimal for where he's going to play in the NFL. So you can see a guy whose best football is ahead of him. And when you're that freakish of an athlete, you really don't need too many pass rushing moves to all of a sudden make an impact. So nine might be a little rich, but if the bears do move down from that number nine pick, if they're comfortable with where the board is and trade down a few spots, I wouldn't be surprised because as you mentioned, the three technique, need in that defense in Matt Eberflus's defense is massive so wait you're telling me because you know my first thing was oh well the Bears have three number twos so maybe they could move up back to the bottom of the first round or high in the second round you're telling me that they might have to go higher to get him oh yeah, he ain't making it to any of those second rounders I, I can guarantee you that an athlete like that in the NFL draft and it's what a first round pick is it's the swing for the fences the team's trying to chase the highest event traits if he falls out of the first round, I will be floored. I just don't think he makes it past pick 31. Okay, so if I'm trying to find a pass rusher maybe a little bit earlier than I want to go with out of Barre, what about Brian Brzee out of Clemson? Because he's had a really interesting rise up, and his career ended in a very bizarre way. What are people saying about him? Yeah, he's one of the biggest, most polarizing prospects in this class because depending on the game you watched from this past year, you could see him as like a day three prospect or you could see him as a top 10 pick. What he did to North Carolina in the ACC championship game was murder. So, I mean, he was, he was a man playing possessed in that game, looked like, you know, the best defense tackle in the class outside of Jalen Carter. But really, those games were so few and far between and had the torn ACL from 2021 that's obviously going to have to get, you know, vetted by any medical staff. And then went through so many issues uh, this past fall that you can maybe forgive him for not putting the best tape out there. So this guy was the number one overall recruit back in 2020 when he was coming out. Had a monster freshman season, but that was his best season. And, you know, it's rare to see a guy peak as a true freshman. So I do think his ball, best ball is ahead of him. But he really comes with a lot of kind of red flags and a lot of kind of concerns to where 
Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he falls in this draft. It ends up being a steal for whoever does take him. What are people telling you about Witherspoon? Because there's a lot of folks that are getting excited about him. I'm one of them. You see me one, man. This guy is a joy to watch play the game of football because he has exactly the type of personality you want from a cornerback in that he can get absolutely torched one play, swing and miss on press coverage, have a guy running by him. The next play, it will not affect him one bit. He'll be right back there on the line of scrimmage in your face trying to beat you up at the line. I, I just love the physicality he plays with, the quick and close ability that he has, and the way he sees the game. He may not be the physically imposing specimen of some other corners in this class, but to me his tape was so far and away the best that he has to be CB1. I'm fascinated by what's gone on with Will Levis because ordinarily what happens is a, a quarterback will rise through this process and maybe get overdrafted. It's starting to look like there's some equilibrium, that people are, are looking at him with a little bit more of an, uh, an honest scouting eye. What are, what are we seeing with him in the draft market right now? Yeah, quarterback's also such a binary position that – you know, there's only some some teams which will not take one. You know, a lot of teams passed on Patrick Mahomes. A lot of teams passed on Justin Herbert just because they didn't need one at the time. And so with three other guys in that mix, there's going to be an odd man out. There's not enough, you know, chairs in this game of musical chairs at the quarterback position to fit all of them in there, even if they are all, you know, in last year's class would have been like top five picks. So I do think he ends up being the odd man out just because, you know, young is Bryce Young. C.J. Stroud's obviously getting coveted as a, more of a pocket passer mold, and Anthony Richardson just has insane physical tools, whereas Levis just kind of, he's old, he has accuracy issues. Uh, those are the concerns with him that yeah, into the teens. I, I don't think he falls past the teens. We're not going to see fall like we saw in last year's quarterback class, but I could see a little bit of a slip for him. Look, I, I'm trying to get playmakers for the Bears, and I get that they're in a place where they probably need offensive and defensive line help. They need help everywhere. Am I crazy to think that it might be worth the risk to add B. John Robinson to the possible people that the Bears take at number nine? I think you are crazy. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm just going to say it. Straight flat out, you are crazy. Because that, that to me, is just <laughs> a little too rich. If, if you trade back, if you're in the 20s, by all means. But you can add a premium pick at a premium position, one that, you know, if you're trying to find on the open market, they'd cost you $30 million a year if you hit on an edge rusher like, say, Tyree Wilson or Adabari come, turns into one of the best three techs in the game. That'll, that'll save you so much money versus the cap. They just need those impact players in premium positions. It's a super deep running back class. Go address that middle of day two. Get, get like a speed steer. Get like a Devin to chain who runs a 4-3-2 next to Fields running a 4-4, and all of a sudden you have uh, you know some electricity in that backfield. All right, just real quick, though. Rank players without position, where do you have B. John Robinson rank? He's number one. I think he's <laughs> the most complete back I've seen. And that, now, that, that doesn't mean he's going to be, you know, all of a sudden Derrick Henry, right? Okay. Like, or Nick Chubb and what they are. But I just think there's no weaknesses to his game. And he really has the complete running back skill set. It's why the comps for him are like Edron James, LT. They're not... They're not run-of-the-mill starters in the NFL. Mike, I appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much for joining us, and thanks for calling me crazy. I need to be put in my place every now and again when it comes to some of this stuff. Thank you, sir. For sure. Thanks for having me. Have a good one.